Good evening. Um, I'm back. And I believe there were some sound problems, and we've turned the volume up. Uh, please, as moment you can't hear me, sort of wave your hand and do that, and I'll, I'll get that man up there to put up the sound again. So, hello, and thanks for coming back. The what? Better than last night. Better than last night, yes. So, Oh, so was that a, a yes? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, yesterday, I suppose let me just put it this way. Um, yesterday was a bit of a rag bag of stuff because I really had to put together um, the, the context within which gangs form in the city. And, and so it's a scatter shoot, really. Um, I apologize if it might have been a bit chaotic because I was jumping from a lot of, uh, across a lot of platforms. But in fact, a lot of platforms have a lot of influence on young people and older people who are also in gangs. And that's an issue we're going to deal with tonight. Who, who are these people that cause us worry, concern, and, and um, kill each other with uh, regular uh, seemingly abandon? Um, and that is... Uh, really the, what we're going to talk about, and tomorrow night we'll talk about possible solutions. Um, and a thing I said, and just to recap really uh, from last night, is, is that Cape Town doesn't, doesn't have a gang problem so much as a youth problem of which gangs are one of the outcomes. Now that's exactly what I said to a, um, a Cape August journalist and he ran a headline across uh, a double-page spread, Cape Town doesn't have a gang problem. Please don't get me wrong. You have to see it in the context of that um, uh, uh, quote. Um, now, just to recap, really, the youth problems, gangs are a part of a, of a much bigger youth problem. And these things are what I was talking about last night. Prenatal stress is, is a big and a new one that, that people hadn't realized was, was an issue in terms of high-risk behavior. Parental attachment uh, is also a big problem, and, and that is, has been well known and uh, is something that, that is being developed as well, especially within the, the health sciences uh, here at UCT. Nutrition, poverty, inappropriate schooling, no jobs. These are obvious uh, uh, problems that we have. The cluster around, uh, uh, if you like, the, what, what is central uh, uh, to gangs. And so just to kind of uh, spin through it, they're an urban phenomenon. They're found mostly in cities throughout the world in, in crowded uh, and low-income areas, uh, which is really why I was looking at the context last night. Um, they... They, they're mostly found within particular types of urban structure, within tenements, within low-cost neighborhoods, within squatter areas, <clears throat> and they're generally in areas of relative poverty. Uh, uh, many of the kids who would consider themselves to be living in poverty would be horrified to go to India, for instance, and find out what poverty really looks like when there's nothing but a piece of cloth to sleep under on the street. I was amazed at how beautifully people come out from under that cloth and go into the day. Um, it's relative poverty that seems to be related to gang formation. They're mainly male, um, and, and, and as much of that is to do with, with identity. It's, it's who you are, how you are seen. Um, and, and there's often parental attachment issues, and uh, there can be connections to mental or physical health issues. Not necessarily, there's usually drugs involved, and they're very often uh, education issues. Um, kids who have dropped out of school. Now, it's when I, um, I I wrote a book called The Brotherhoods, and I I described gangs as as criminal gangs, and I was quite uh, seriously criticised, quite correctly, um, uh, because uh, my definition of gangs in those days, and that was some years ago, was very narrow, and and that criticism forced me to take very seriously the concept of gangs, which is. Um, really, what I'm talking to you about this evening, uh, the, you know, what that broadening of the concept of gangs actually is. Um, gangs, of course, have a bad rap. I mean, they are not liked. They are generally, all over the world, considered to be bad dudes. Or, as somebody said, as I mentioned last night, 
uh, you know, bad motherfuckers. Uh, that's how they describe themselves even. Um, so what I want to do now is, is have a look at what a gang is. I w w would, would ask people um, in, in Hanover Park or somewhere, uh, you ask a, a gangster, uh, what is a gang? And he says, us, we are a gang, that's who we are. And you ask a resident there, and they will point to these kids on the corner and say, that's a gang, that is a gang. And, and that seems so completely obvious to everybody what a gang is that the, the business of writing and researching gangs seemed silly to them. They, they were, they, it was obvious what they were. They were bad kids on the street corner causing trouble. Well, it's not actually as easy as that. Um, and the guy who started gang studies, Frederick Thrasher, in Chicago in the 1920s, uh, that is his definition. And really, if you're working with any cluster of people, you have to have a definition against which you measure what you're looking at. That's the, I suppose, an academic approach. But, um, and, and if you look at that, that um, uh, definition by Thrasher, um, it's types of behavior, it's meeting, it's milling, it's, uh, it's the result of collective behavior, tradition, unreflective internal structures. And if you look at all of that, there's no mention of crime in it at all. A, 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 a gang is not necessarily criminal, if you use that description of it. But in, a, in countries where gangs have become increasingly a problem, they have been defined in terms of the laws against them. We have a Prevention of Organized Crime Act called POCA, and it <clears throat> took um, straight from the Californian description of gangs um, its legislation. And we have this POCA legislation which defines gangs uh, as this ongoing association um, where commission of criminal offenses is, is, is the core issue. Um, and there are signs and symbols uh, which they collectively engage in. It almost uh, it defines every kid on the Cape Flats can fit into their description. Um, if you associate with, if you are seen in the company of, if you have photographs connected to gangs, poker is completely unmanageable and unusable. And in fact, many of the cops I've talked to don't use it. Uh, it's a very unwieldy bit of legislation, and the definition is so broad um, that you can chuck it at anything, um, and, but, but nothing will stick uh, in a court of law. So uh, that is a, a, another kind of definition. And, and so I was forced, in a way, to come up with my own definition, and, and, and I decided that what I really should do, uh, if I want to see it uh, clearly, is to make it simple, a gang being a group of people with common interests who come together with a common purpose. Okay, that's really broad. Um, um, and if it's criminal, then, then it's a criminal gang. And if you use that, that definition, what happens is that, that you suddenly discover that there's a lot more in gangs than, than you first imagined. So in order to try and figure out what a gang is, there, there are ways of describing the structure of the gangs, what, what's happening inside them. And there have been various uh, ways in which, which um, they've been described. One is a hierarchy, and many different gangs have different shapes, and they, they conform to, to some of these hierarchies. The, the, the hard livings is probably a hierarchy. A corporation is a hierarchy. It has a CEO at the top, and it has people underneath it, and has people un underneath that. Um, the uh, my gang, if you like, the, the mongrels, uh, they have about 3,000 members. And the, the core is definitely a corporation at the top. Um, and it's, it's run by one man whose word is law. And that is definitely a hierarchy. And, and, and that is the kind of structure of gang that the poker legislation considers to be a gang. And, and so what they try and do is pick off what they call the high flyers, take the top guys out, and then everything will be OK. Um, now, the problem with that is the next definition, that gangs are also networks. There are nodes, and there are supply chains, and they, they, are, they will come together for a certain job, like um, a particular, there's a call out for a particular kind of Mercedes, 
And they will come together around the need to procure five of those Mercedes from you and me. Um, I don't drive one, but maybe you do. And they will, they will come together, but then they will break up and do something else. So the high flyer concept of taking out the top guys doesn't actually work in that kind of gang. And many of the, um, the named gangs in the city operate like that. The, very definitely gangs are markets. Money is an issue. It's a key issue. And, and services, territories, products dictate that. So you, you'll find that, that um, the, the way heroin is coming in uh, arrives in a particular way and, and a gang will kind of form around that market system. But um, if you're dealing in, in, in stolen goods, it's a different kind of structure that will be needed. <clears throat> you have a, need a different kind of structure to deal with dacha or cannabis um, and cocaine because they're coming from different places and uh, they, they're structured in different ways. <clears throat> and the, the other thing, and, and, and actually this is a particular interest of mine, that, that gangs are also clans. <clears throat> very old clans, actually, some of them. And there's a sort of loyalty. If you see any movies about gangs, you're going to find mostly that they will be structured around the concept of the clan, the mafia, the, 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 the lead guy is the godfather. That, that whole concept is a clan concept. And it, it, it's also true of, of some gangs. And, and you know, mafia with a small m, is that, not the mafia, but it, a, a mafia is a clan structure. So those are various structures. Now, uh, I really want to talk, I want to elaborate a bit on, on that whole idea uh, of a clan structure, just for a bit, because I think it's fascinating. I'll tell you why um, I think it's fascinating, and, and that is that um, the impetus to join gangs is let me start somewhere else. Actually, I was working with, with two other people and we, um, Dalla Omar had tasked us to put together the Child Justice Act. Uh, there was no child justice law in South Africa prior to 94. Um, and we were given this rather onerous task of trying to put together legislation. And, and we were looking all over the world for appropriate legislation, looking in Western countries and finding that, that, that uh, youth justice all around the world is appalling. America is terrible. In Britain, they lock them up. In, uh, so we were starting to look elsewhere. And, and one of my tasks, um, I suppose because of my background, is to look at traditional systems uh, of justice in, 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 in the way in which traditional societies deal with, with young people who get into trouble. And the interesting thing is that, that um, traditional societies presume, quite correctly, that young people, adolescents, are unmanageable and need to have something done about them. Uh, there, there's no argument about that. Right across the world, in Fiji, the, uh, an Aboriginal culture, in, in, in uh, Maori culture, in, in Native American, all of them have systems that deal with kids causing trouble. And um, I was in, in the Transkai, um, uh, because that's where I come from, and I was uh, with a group of uh, Tosa men uh, at a beer drink, and the, there must have been about 50 of them, and the beer drink I've slowly discovered had a purpose. It was not just that they were drinking beer and talking. Um, they were waiting for a young man who was uh, a part of a maqueta ceremony. It's, we know maqueta as circumcision, but of course maqueta is much more than that. In the old days it used to be a warrior ceremony, and it would be nine months long perhaps, and they would be trained to be warriors, and the end part of that would be a circumcision. But this young guy, before the actual circumcision, but during his ceremony, he had a task to perform. And so the guy sitting next to me told me when I saw this young guy very nervously walking down the mountain towards the group. And, and uh, in closer culture, the, the, uh, a young person, who, uh, a young man, um, who has uh, not gone through the ceremony of manhood uh, is a pickin'. He's he's not listened to. You know, you, you don't listen to a young man who hasn't become a man, uh, a young person. And so he's grown up his whole life not listened to by older men. And he has a group of 50 men, they're sitting around, and he has a task to do. He has three things he has to do. He has to um, join the group, he has to uh, drink some beer, and he has to say something. And this is what the, the chap I'm sitting next to tells me. And so he comes down the mountain, and they make space, and he sits on a, um, a sort of drum, 
Um, and, and nobody says anything. There's no, hello, how are you? He just sits down. He joins the group. And uh, the beer's passed, and he has some beer, and he looks sort of, this is very exciting, and he hands it on. And, and his final task is, is to say something. Now, he's never been listened to by men in his life. And uh, there might, and it turned out, there was a good reason. There's a reason in, in, in these old cultures for that kind of uh, non-recognition towards the power of the recognition. And I'm watching this guy very carefully, and he finally says something. And everybody stops and goes, eh, hey, okay, that's right, that's right. And then they carry on talking, but I'm watching him. And I, I, it's hard to describe what happened. He became a man like that. His whole demeanor changed. He, 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 he just, the, the, the power of recognition and acceptance. Uh, when he got up to walk away afterwards, he was not the guy who went to sit down. It was just the most extraordinary experience. It's hard to describe. And that, that was one of the things that uh, got me and, and us involved in the way in which we created the Child Justice Act um, around transitional moments that, that we can put into justice that change the way in which we deal with, with young people. And that's part of uh, what I do at the Chrysalis Academy, and that's probably why they invited me to be there, because uh, you know, they like that kind of thing. And, and so <clears throat> what, what, I, <clears throat> what I came away with is, what is that? What, what is going on there? What is happening? And I, there, there have been writings about this, and, and one of the guys who uh, has written a lot about this is an American called Arnold van Gennep. Oh, I think he's Dutch, actually, but he was writing in the States. And, and he, he looked at this process of transition that happens, and, it, and, and, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm talking about this in the context of gangs in a moment, but, but he says there's a moment of separation where the young person is no longer a child, and, but they're not yet an adult. And there's this extraction from the, the social structure. He's talking about traditional systems where there's sort of language and posture and disposition changes. And we know that from, from adolescence. We, we probably have them and they, they get antsy, they get difficult and they start distancing from you and bouncing off you. And then there's what, what Van Gennep calls liminality. The limen is a door frame. Uh, it's a French word. Maybe Van Gennep was French. But it doesn't sound like it. But it means neither here nor there. You're neither this way or that way. You, you're in the middle. And, and in traditional societies, it's a state of magic. It's the state of anything can happen. Um, and and uh, traditional societies amplify that state of magic. Um, they create ceremonies. Uh, you might not know, but bungee jumping uh, is one of those ceremonies, Vanatu. It comes from there where they jump off towers which they build with vines around their feet. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a rite of passage. So what I'm looking at here, or what I found I was looking at, is a rite of passage into adulthood. And um, the liminality is a time of kind of craziness. There's, you know, tattooing comes out of that, body, body mutilations, performance warriorness in battle. Um, uh, confusion between reality uh, and fantasy uh, is very much part of that time. Uh, movie heroes are part of that and uh, in, in modern world. And what I started seeing in, in the ceremonies and rituals and processes that were going on in traditional societies, I was seeing exactly the same thing happening in the gangs that I was involved in. They, they didn't have elders to to, to go through the process, but they were going through processes of ritual anyway. I'm going, what's going on here? Do adolescents internally need so much? They, they, they need that transitional process that they create them for themselves. But um, what the problem was, in traditional society, you have that sort of childhood, you have that fall into liminality, but you have structures which pick you up and turn you into an adult, if you like. The, 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 those are rituals. With the gangs, it's the same initial sort of need, but, but there's what I call a free fall. They're going to free fall. There's no uh, rituals and processes and elders to pick them up, to put them back where they are, so they get deeper and deeper into trouble. Um, and, and really, that's what, what, what I'm trying to show here. 
Um, uh, one is a process of integration into society. The other is a process of dispersion in wider and wider and further and further. The more uh, uh, gang rituals occur, the, the more society rejects them and the further they get from society, so they can't get back in. Um, so that is, uh, I suppose, uh, elaborating on the clan structure um, to a certain extent, but, but that is um, what, what I think the gang initiative is from the internal needs of the kids, quite apart from all the stuff I was talking about last night about how a situation arrives at a, 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 a gang. There's also an internal move and a desire to be part of a group of um, peer, a peer group and to shine in, in that space. And if you look at the traditional um, uh, and gang rites of passage, there's a lot of parallels. Um, there's the induction, there's the sacred ground, the neighborhood turf, um, there's peer ceremonies which are the same, they're initiatory uh, death and rebirth, which, which very often is the shootouts uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in our areas here. Um, and you have the whole warriorhood, scarring, tattooing thing. Um, the problem is you don't have, as I said, community acceptance. And, and that is, makes it very difficult for these kids to get back. Um, but, but kids get into gangs because of a sense of belonging, the fact that there's peers, there's mentors in the gang bosses, and if you remember, you know, these, many, many of these kids don't have fathers um, to, to um, talk about young men, um, and, and the gang boss is the only mentor around. Many of these areas, um, I found that the state has lost control of them completely. The, 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 the syndicates run those areas and the, uh, you know, the state in terms of government officials move in and out of there, but the core of that um, will be the syndicates and the syndicate bosses become the, the, the mentors. Um, and and they, there's, whole, there's all these rituals of getting into it and there's an opportunity uh, that, that these people have to, to prove themselves. And, and so what I found is that there's, if you, if you look, and, and this is where it becomes useful, if you look at those requirements, that sense of belonging, peer support, mentors and things, you can build that into programs. Uh, you, you can actually take, um, I, have, I, I always say to, to uh, people who, who I have been assisting with, with getting programs together, make them look like gangs, make them feel like gangs, build gangs take them into a different space. Kids like that structure, it works for them in a strange way. It sounds odd, uh, people look at me a bit strangely because here's a guy tra trying to get rid of gangs and I'm telling him to build gangs, but actually th there's, there's an element of truth in that. Okay, the question is, does this only apply to colored gangs? Does it apply to only uh, African gangs? Or, or It's across the board. The, the, uh, people come from different traditions. Adolescents need the same thing. A lot of my work has been on Cape, or almost all my work on gangs has been in Cape Town, and this is an area where the majority of the working class are colored. So it sounds as though uh, uh, most of my, what, what I'm talking about is colored, but it's, you know, it's not true. The, you'll find the same structures I'm talking about in, in African structures, in um, Brazilian structures, in, you know, in structures all over the world. These, these core issues um, are not confined to uh, a type of, and certainly not to a skin color. It's, it's, it's not that kind of uh, thing. Uh, I don't know whether that helps, but it's. Uh, but pe perhaps as we go on, you can ask the question in a different way. Uh, when you talk about sacred ground, is, it, is that applicable to colored gangs? Oh yes, um, uh, turf, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and if it doesn't answer quite exactly, uh, let me know. But but that's what I'm going to be talking about with colored gangs as well. Now, you know, if if you take that that my broad definition. It's a very, very wide catch net. It's a group of people with common interests coming together for a common criminal purpose. Now, now who, who are these people? Well, there's a lot more than you might imagine. It, 
it, it works with play groups, it works with warrior gangs, and I'll go into what I mean by these. There are girl gangs, merchant gangs, syndicates, uh, corporate racketeers, state officials, and transnational organized crime. They all fit into that definition. There's a hell of a lot more gangs than you imagine uh, if you use a simple definition of criminal uh, association. The, the difference is that the, the, you know, you've got the with weapons group and the without weapons group. That's, that's kind of the distinction. The, the, the with weapons group is what we really worry about. Um, we often don't realize that the without weapons group are, and that's why those bubbles are bigger, cause far more damage um, than, than the, the guy, the with weapons group. And uh, I don't expect you to read all that, but, but that's a kind of grid that I made in order to understand the different kinds, and I'm going to go through these in a moment. Um, the, between the violent and the non-violent, the, there's, you know, the, there's, there's, there's connection. Do you, do you want to have a look at that? Sorry, I put things up and then don't give you time to read it. <laughs> Okay, give you a moment on that one. I'll be going through these uh, in, in a moment, um, uh, each one of them. An interesting one um, that I found uh, are Tuk soldiers. These, these guys will actually uh, do battle with guns issued to them um, for, for their drugs. Uh, they're a particular scary crowd. Can I just, I'm gonna go into those in detail now. If you look at that definition, there are a lot of kids that are playing gang in the way that, that um, uh, other people play cowboys and crooks or whatever they play. The, 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 the the game kids play in these, these Cape Flats, the poorer uh, uh, Cape Flats areas, they're gang games. They, they fight each other as gangs. They play, they shoot and play dead. They are almost uh, pacing themselves towards an ideology of gangness, even at that age. Um, uh, I'm a photographer also, and I've, uh, this is a kid I took. I, I, I said, are you in a gang? And he raised this, this gun at me. Um, they. They, they're pacing themselves towards gangness. But the next crowd, and they are, um, they are, sorry? Where do they get their guns? Where do they get their guns? Everywhere. Um, um, <laughs> let me divert into where they get their guns. Um, Rashid Stahi took two trucks into a uh, foray uh, army camp and blew the door and, and, and divested the entire army camp of its weapons. That's, that's one way they get. A lot of the weapons are, uh, they come from people, house robberies, where people sleep with a gun next to them. Um, uh, the, the parabellum, the, the, the South Africa produces nine millimeter handguns, uh, huge, huge numbers of them, Donnell. And in the 1980s, the late 1980s and early 1990s, they handed thousands of these to the Encarta Freedom Party without numbers on them to use against ANC cadres. And these have got into the, 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 the circuit. And um, the, the, the border wars have produced a lot of guns, particularly AKs and R1s. These, these things have filtered down and the trading that goes on for drugs also involves weapons. So, so there's a lot of that. It's very, very easy to get guns in the city. Too easy to get guns. Um, the, there was a case recently, you might have uh, seen it, where um, the guns that were handed in, the illegal guns, there was a the moratorium, you could hand in your guns. Um, now, all these guns went up to Pretoria for destruction, and a senior policeman was selling them back to the gangs in Cape Town. Um, one of the cops who investigated that and bust him has now been himself demoted because he obviously that process was touching higher up in the system, but I won't go there. The, the other group um, of kids who fall into that, that context uh, or that definition are what I call warrior gangs. These are young people, mainly in Kailicha, they're girls and, and boys. They're very young. 
And they were, I think, probably the scariest. I'm not scared of gangs, and I've been involved with gangs for years and years, and they've never actually scared me, except these kids, because they were, they were very young. And I was there with a camera, and, and uh, their presumption was money in my pocket. They needed tick. And, and you know, they, they were sort of sizing me up to see that what they could take off me. Um, it, it was okay in the end, simply because what I said last night, young kids who find that an adult is interested in them, talk to them. They, they, there's a trust level because there's, there's so few adults who've ever talked to them with interest that, that finally it was cool to be with these kids. But they are uh, they 14, 15, 16, they fight with pangas and knives. They think that guns are very unmanly. Um, it's almost a tradition that's come out of the stick fighting uh, tradition because, you know, a place like Kailicha is largely the Eastern Cape. It, um, most of the kids I talked to were actually born in the Eastern Cape and their parents come here a bit for a better life. And, and these kids fight battles. They kill each other. Uh, a lot of them have, have scars. And they are pretty scary and very young and get high. And they use magic. There are particular sangomas they go to to get armbands and, and necklaces made out of all sorts of strange things, including their own blood, um, which they wear in order to be invisible. Um, and if you're invisible, you can do anything. So, so they're very brave uh, until they're dead, if you know what I mean. It's, it's, uh, it's not good for them. Now, the issue around warrior gangs is really, it's a, it's a masculinity issue, it's trans what I call transformance. It's the performance you go through as an adolescent to, to, to be more. And it's, it's definitely peer group cred. You're almost fighting this guy, watching to see if that guy is watching you. It's a, it's a theater performance with pangas and knives. Uh, it's pretty freaky stuff. The, the merchant gangs are, are the core of the, the Cape Town gangs, and they are indeed largely colored, although they are, um, uh, you know, they are all colors in them. I find actually it very difficult to talk about color, um, given that it takes me quite a while to figure out what color somebody is. I suppose I spend so much time um, uh, mixing with these kids. I, I, I never, it's never my first port of call to find out what color they are, but eventually you figure out, oh, I suppose they would be defined as, you know, something or other. But if, if I was to define the, the core of the merchant gangs, they, they are the old Cape Town working class. There's often three generations deep in the gang. And, and these guys are, um, they are merchant gangs because they buy and sell. Uh, their, their turf wars are very um, fierce because they are selling boundaries. These are drug selling boundaries, and and uh, and if if somebody goes over that boundary, and it's an imaginary boundary, uh, it might be a street, the middle of the street. If he steps over, he's transgressed. The, he's moved from the hard livings into the Americans or the junky, funky kids area or something, and 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 somebody shoots him, and then somebody shoots them because he shot them, and you suddenly have a gang war. Um, uh, these guys are highly organized. They, um, they have old the traditions, and they, they are linked to the prison gangs, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, they, I've been in, in gang fights where bullets are flying down the street, and it's, it's, they're, they're terribly bad shots. Um, but but they, I, was, uh, I was sitting with a, a guy from the Americans um, gang. I was interviewing him in, in Mannenberg. Um, and I was in the, 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 uh, the sort of cultural center, um, community center, and suddenly this gang war goes off, and I look at him, because, you know, what's his response to, to the, the, I'm, I'm just thinking, don't hit my car, it's in the street down there. Um, and, and he's going, 38 special, nine millimeter, that's an AK, nine millimeter again. And, he, and he's listing the boom, bang, wham, noise, uh, with, with absolute calm, he's figuring out what's going on. Um, and and uh, these guys are, are, are structured, they're, they're fairly structured, I'll talk about that in a moment. It's, it's also about masculinity and peer respect, but it's definitely about turf defense. It's the movement of illegal goods and it's control of areas. Um, and there are lots and lots of gangs. I mean, uh, as I say, the mongrels have about 3,000. I should imagine the hard livings probably have about 5,000 members. They have chapters. Um, uh, the Americans, um, uh, they will, 
sort of subcontract leadership. So they, they're more of a network. The, the hard livings are more of a corporate structure uh, under Stuckey, even though he was in jail for a long time, he uh, had control. And of the gangs. Uh, it depends on what gang you're talking about. Um, I'm going to be talking in a moment about transnational uh, gangs. Um, these guys <clears throat> will have connections all over the country, and they're spreading. Because pressure got put on them um, in Cape Town, <clears throat> the merchant gangs <clears throat> upon me have moved increasingly into the smaller towns. Worcester is now a very big center, gang center. Um, and, and even smaller places um, like Darling and, and these places, the gangs are moving there and they're basing themselves in there and operating in Cape Town. So they move. Port Elizabeth has now got a lot of, of, of ex Cape Town gang connections. So the merchant gangs don't go further than the country, but as you'll see in a moment, they don't have to because they're networked into other systems that do that. Um, and uh, Th these are the sexy, the, the sexy boys. I think they're the sexy boys. Um, if you, you see a flag there, it looks like a British flag. Um, that's part of their rituals. They they align themselves to different countries. The Americans are the Americans, and the 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 rituals of entry are very strange. They they will say the red stripes are the blood on the. Why, the, 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 our blood on the white background and the stars are the stars of uh, the, the 50, the 38, or I don't know how many states, 50 states are, they, they will, and the dollar sign, they, often they, their tattoos are dollar signs, they will be the American eagle, um, they will be American things. The, um, the mongrels are British, they will, they will tattoo uh, the British flag, they will, um, uh, they will have pound symbols and things like that. They, they align themselves, but they use these things as rituals for entry. You have to know these things. You have to go through these processes and, and, and be part of that. And they also numbers, and I'll talk about that in a moment. They, they connect it into the numbers, and the reason why uh, is very interesting. This, <clears throat> these, these, uh, you would probably think these were a bunch of kids hanging around. This is the mongrel's defense team that defense, defend the headquarters. They are all armed. I'm sorry. sorry to interrupt, but you skipped a picture. Did I? Yeah, two or three pictures back. That one. Yeah. That's just selling drugs, basically. Those, those are, um, the, drugs are, are, are very central to, to the, the merchant gang. Sorry, I didn't mention that, but they, they're very part of that. Um, I'll tell you in a moment. <laughs> but thanks for asking. This is the moment. Um, you'll see that he's got a 27 tattooed um, on him, and but he is a merchant gang. What happened is that the up until um, 94. Uh, the, the merchant gangs, or all gangs actually, were very territorial. They were, they were, they would be just Hanover Park would be their area, and they'd have another chapter there. And, and what happens when countries um, open their borders, like Russia did and like South Africa did, is transnational crime comes pouring in. All the good things come in with all the bad things as well. And the mafia and the tongs and uh, the Colombians, uh, the Nigerians, uh, the Moroccans, uh, a whole range of, of, of criminal syndicates moved into South Africa in 94 on, from 94 onwards. And they w saw this very lucrative market, particularly the drug market and the, the, the stolen cars market, and they tried to move in. What happened is that the local merchant gangs, who never worked together, they usually fought, got together, they formed the firm, they formed core. Um, th th those didn't last long, but what they did is that they agreed to, um, to, to keep control by bilateral connection. 
And that lateral, that lattice of lateral connection was the prison gangs because so many of these, these people had come through prisons. And, and, and the prison system is very old, and um, I'll talk about it in a moment. It, it, it has very strong military rituals. And, and those rituals, um, Ernie Lustach really went to, to, to jail in, in, um, uh, for a while. He was a very rich drug dealer. And, and he went to, to prison in the late 80s. And he didn't fall into the prison gang system. He was very wealthy. He could buy his way out of the rituals. But he saw the value in that. And when he came out, he started creating the numbers gangs because the numbers gangs are, um, uh, that's the 26s, 5 and 6. That's the 27s. And that's the 28s. That's what the gang signs are about. So if somebody goes like that, he's a 27. They have different things that they do. Um, and, and, and by using those, it became a set, set of rituals that was very attractive to young people, the, the prison gang. It, it became a status symbol to go to prison to get a number. But eventually, the, the, the merchant gangs were inducting um, young people uh, going through the rituals uh, outside a prison, and, and they, were cr they, they created a military structure that actually repelled the foreign um, the syndicates. And, and so Cape Town is, we're very proud of the fact that Cape Town is entirely controlled on the streets by our boys. Um, they've kept the other guys out. The, the, um, all the others are, the, the, the Nigerians are, are sort of wheedling back in, but um, basically all the other international syndicates, they're suppliers into the system. But, but the local guys control the turf, and they didn't lose the turf. And that is why that's the, that's the overlap. Um, oops, sorry, flicking through. Um, just before we finish with merchant gangs, there, there is a particular structure. Um, you have a leadership. They, they have a particular structure. That's the leadership and the hardcore around them. You get associates who will move in and out of that, that central core. You get a fringe. And that the fringe is usually um, uh, young guys. They, they hardly ever see the gang leader. They, they interact more with, with the hardcore other guys. Um, and, and they will be, uh, you'll get the, um, the shooters who, who, who have the guns. You'll get the, the drug sellers. Um, you'll get the spotters. The spotters are the guys who, who got gedachters. They can see what's going on. And you get the hangers on. And, and all of these form the kind of fringe. And beyond that, you get the people who want in, the young people who want to get in. They, I call them wannabes. They, they kind of, they call themselves, uh, you know, the, 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 I'm an I'm a HL, but, but they're actually not. But they want to be, and they're always doing favors for, for, for the, the fringe guys, who are, of course, themselves doing uh, favors for the, the associates. And then you get kind of odd things that are cliques. They're little cliques that are power groups around certain people. Um, and they will uh, they, they associate or not associate with, with the gang, depending on, on uh, what happens. The, the associates are uh, often drug merchants who aren't themselves in the gang, but are connected to one of the gangs. They, they use the gang for protection, but they are, they, are, they are kind of independent in a way. Around the merchant gangs are girl gangs. When I started this work, there weren't any. I, I, I was starting this work in the... Um, oh, way back in the 80s. And uh, people kept saying, are there girl gangs? And no, they weren't. Now there are lots and lots of girl gangs. There are girl gangs not only in the merchant gangs. There are girl gangs, uh, very strong ones, in the Amahura, Amavata. They call them Vura babes or the Vata babes. Um, they, they, they're part of the, the sort of warrior gangs. And they're tough. Um, and they do a, a lot of, they, they, they sort of work with the gangs. They, they're a support group. They, are, they will also be independently, um, you know, stealing and hiding guns. They, they also become powerful. They raise their profile. And quite often when they're at school, everybody, all the other girls are in awe of them. You know, you don't mess with her because she's part of the Vuras or she's part of the hard livings. Um, so they definitely get a lot of status uh, out of being in the gangs. Um, I interviewed one uh, young girl, and it, it, it was really difficult. You know, she was 
She was 25. She was very pretty. She looked a bit sort of weather-worn, but she was very pretty. She's very polite, and she started unfolding this life, and it was just a life of tragedy. I mean, she, she had a, a daughter when she was 15. Um, she, her mother was on took, her father was in jail. You know, it just went on and on and on. Um, and, and towards the end, I said, do you have any grandparents? Um, she said, I've got a grandmother. I said, how do you get on with her? She just started crying. Her grandmother was everything to her. She, she the only one that had held her together. Uh, we had to stop the interview. She just started sobbing. I felt really bad. Um, beyond the, the merchant gangs, you have uh, the, the syndicates. These, these, those that are alive, which are the bottom two, are, are the, you know, the tough guys in, 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 in the city. Um, the, the, the one on the bottom left is Gewelt Thomas. Gewelt uh, is like a uh, wild man. He um, had the, the sexy boys, I think the sexy boys was his gang. He uh, involved with so many murders. It was quite amazing. At one stage during his trial, it came up that he, would, he had a, a truck and he put an armchair in it uh, and it had a high-powered rifle with a telescopic sights. And, and um, the, he, he'd drive through the areas where his enemies were, and the guys are passing armaments out through the, the back window, and he was potting uh, his enemies with a, with a telescopic sight. Um, he was eventually, he and the gang were, were, were put in jail pending the trial, and during the uh, trial period, he ordered the hit and death of another 22 people while in prison on a cell phone. More than a thousand cell phone calls were logged, and you're not allowed to have a cell phone in prison. I mean, he had that kind of power. He was handed seven life sentences, so he's sitting. Um, Rashid Stakhi is the, the, the other guy uh, on the right at the bottom. He's around. He says he's turned to Jesus, and he's a lay preacher, but I don't know how many people believe him. Uh, he's the head of the hard livings. The other two guys are dead. Uh, Colin Stansfield and, and Ernie Lustach um, were uh, serious mobsters. And these guys, they, they don't, they're not part of gangs. They, 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 they are the, the godfathers, if you like, of, of the situation, the local situation. And, and they will, they link to these foreign syndicates and they will, they will conduit the stuff in and, and distribute it. And, but a lot of them, a lot of these, these, these syndicate bosses are legitimate. I found, um, um, I, I discovered organizations that they had named that they were contractors and trucking, they had trucking organizations and um, contracting organizations. And I looked on the city council's list of, of registered contractors and they were there. They work for the city council. Um, th there was a, a, a slightly odd incident uh, linked to that. In Nyanga, the, 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 the city was building a whole new area of the, the VPUU, uh, violence pr prevention through urban upgrading, is doing some great work here. And they, they're building new structures. And when they started, they handed this whole thing to a contractor the contractor came in and the hard living said to him, this is our territory. It's going to cost you because they do protection rackets. Um, so the contractor wanted the contract, so he was paying 23,000 rand a month to the hard livings um, and threw out the contract, which the council didn't know about. And then he could, the project was completed, lots of fanfare, and the mayor opened it with a ribbon, and then they started on the next uh, block. And the sexy boys came and said, this is our area. I believe you are paying them 23,000. We want uh, the same. And the contractor, in the middle of that chaos, the hard livings decided the sexy boys didn't have a right to do it. Um, in three months, 23 people were dead in that area. The, it was one of the biggest gang wars last two years. They just like the, everybody was getting shot. Um, and the council was paying the gangs. So they, they sort of very integrated. When, when I was. Um, uh, in, into corporate stuff as well. I, I was sitting in the, the mongrel's uh, uh, sort of uh, head office, um, and this Pentechnican pulled up, big Pentechnican, and the guy was working underneath, and then the little thing opened, and these bags of dacha came out, and, and, and it was transported in, he did it up again, 
And um, this was way back in the 80s. And the company, they, they had special compartments in this trucking line. The trucking line, wait for it, was called Mainline Carriers. <laughs> and more importantly, it was owned by Nico Dietrich's son, the state president's son. Um, Bobby April said to me, if you say this, if you write this, you are dead, you understand, from the gang side and from the government side. So just shut up. But now all of that's past, so I can tell you. The syndicates are into protection rackets. They, they run the bouncing, the bounces uh, uh, situation. I, I, I suppose that uh, Mark Liffman, who you might have heard of uh, uh, in Cape Town, is, he's connected to the sexy boys. He would be considered a sec uh, syndicate boss, uh, very powerful. Don't cross him. Um, they import and export. They're also involved in bribery and, and a, a lot of legitimate practices. Now, prison gangs are, are very old, more than 100 years old. They, the, the prison gang tradition comes out of um, a gang, a, a guy called Jan Note was um, preying on the uh, migrants that were going to the mines in the 19th century. And he was, he was taking their pay packets off, the, off them. And he, he, he became a notorious gangster. And the, the, the gang, he, he had visions. And there were all sorts of things that he, he believed he saw. And uh, he, he became known as Nongolazo. And he, um, he had this whole ritual of, of how the gang came about. It's to do with a, a red bull and how the bull was... Um, uh, um, skinned and, and certain things were written on the bull. And then he had a, an associate who had a slightly different view and that had to do with a stone that was broken. You know, th there's a whole ritual issue. Anyway, uh, these guys were eventually put in Cinderella prison and they, they, they recreated the gang system there. And it was such a compelling, I mean, you really ought to um, read something like The Number, Johnny Steinberg's book, it's about this kind of stuff. Um, it's all a story, and, and so much of gang stuff is a story. It's a story people tell about themselves to make themselves relevant in the world and, and, and feel good. But the, the, the best story in the gang business is definitely the prison gang story. Um, it's weird, it's magical, it's, uh, um, if you think about it, how, if I go into prison and, and I, I, I say I'm a number, I, I say, you know, how's it guys, and they say, <laughs> You say you're a 26. Well, prove it. Well, I've got nothing to prove it. Sorry, when I look down, it makes a noise. Um, so they say, dress yourself. How do I know you, they say. And I've got to dress myself according to my rank. If I'm a sergeant um, or, or whatever, I've got to say I've got, you know, X number of stars here, I've got this, I've got that, my, I've got a sword in, in, my, in my left belt, I've got a gun in my right pocket, uh, my boots are red, I have turnips in grey trousers, you, you, you go through this whole thing. And only if you have been inducted into that can you know that. So that's how, I mean, it's a brilliant system of, of knowing what rank you are. Um, it caused a lot of trouble when the merchant gangs were starting to, to uh, induct people in the streets because that, that rigid process wasn't happening. By the way, the sword is a spoon that, that you hold the handle and you shop on the, the other side. Um, and you, you have to draw blood. I mean, part of the, the gang ritual and the entry is to draw blood. Um, if you get into trouble, by the way, uh, the sentences are, um, I think it's six minutes, six hours, six days, or six years. The heaviest sentence will be six years. It means somebody is going to stab you in the next six minutes. The next, six, you, you, you know, you know that your sentence is to be stabbed. Um, and uh, imagine getting a six-year sentence. E and this, these sentences go with you to other prisons. The the the, the network is 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 well known. Um, that's one of the reasons why there is all this tattoos on the prison gangs. They're not good tattoos. Um, but a lot of it is they tattoo their rank and their status and their stuff on, on, on their own bodies. It happens in prison um, with needles and often the black uh, uh, stuff in the top of bottle tops. They, they melt it down and put that into the skin. Um, one of the, the problems with that is uh, if you ever want a tattoo removed, uh, a, um, a legitimate tattoo, 
person, the, 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 the tattoo is going in at the right, same depth. These guys don't have that depth. My wife uh, worked for a plastic surgeon, and she said getting off a, a prison tattoo is almost impossible because you, had, you didn't know what layer of the skin that they were going into. Um, and it, it's really about power. If, if you're powerless, um, if you're sitting doing nothing, what is the story you tell yourself about why you are there? And, and the prison gang's story is, is, is really a very complicated one because they, they're doing time. They've got lots of time to create these stories of, of themselves. Um, where are we? Sorry, that what? They might have been brothers. I, I, I actually never noticed that. Um, they do look very similar, but it's hard to know. They look good. Um, the difference between the gangs is that the 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 twenty sevens are they 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 they're supposed to procure stuff. The 26s tend to be the warriors who are the police, and the 28s are different because they allow sex uh, between men, um, uh, and and they they are not highly. I mean, each each has their own way of going about it. The 28s are interesting in that they have the gold line and the silver line. Um, the gold line are the men, the silver line are the women, um, the vafis they call them. Um, they don't consider it homosexuality, even though they do penetrate. They, they consider the, the different levels of masculinity. And um, th these, these ideas were very secret uh, until very recently. Um, but but uh, this is the, 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 the 26 rules that I found. Um, and they're very, you know, they, they, they're interesting rules. You can't do what you want. You can't lie with your brother. That means you're not at 28. You can't have sex. Um, you've got to do honest work. You've got to respect the wardens. You, 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 um, you won't physically harm prison gang members, um, and, and you'll die as a brother under the flag. It's a, uh, you know, it's, these, are, these, are, these are laws that could operate outside prison, and you can see why they were useful for the merchant gangs. Um, and Apart from Steinberg's book, the, the small matter of a horse, Charles von Onslen. Charles von Onslen writes beautifully, and and uh, his book is about the the history and the origin uh, of the prison gangs. And there's a new book by uh, Morgan and Medini, White Paper, White Ink. Uh, it's a novel, but it's based very definitely on Medini's experiences, and it's uh, they are they are local Cape Town. It's an interesting book. Now. If you look beyond that, 